Thank you everybody for joining session five. Um, this is going to be a talk by Dr. Carl Fisher um, on the clinical applications of biophotonics. So over to you, Carl. All right. Yeah, thank you, uh, Katrina. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Katrina said, my name is Carl. I'm a researcher with uh, Professor Anderson Engels, as well as a medical student here at UCC. Um, so my PhD was, I guess, in clinical biophotonics, or at least uh, biophotonics applications uh, for cancer. Uh, and I was asked to give a talk this year on some clinical applications. Uh, so in terms of the outline, I, Brian did had an excellent talk on Monday, so I'll probably uh, not spend too much time on an intro to biophotonics. Now I'll just do a brief overview of some diagnostic and therapeutic uh, applications of biophotonics. Then the way I did this talk, I thought it'd be interesting, I guess, for most users was to just go through some case presentations and how biophotonics was going to be used for that. And then at the end, I have an interactive case where I'd like you guys to think about in terms of what we've spoken about today, how that could be used for this uh, scenario. And then uh, just a question and answer period at the end, if there's any questions. And for the learning objectives, hoping, hoping that uh, everyone can gain an understanding for the different applications of biophotonics within clinical medicine, understand some differences between diagnostics and therapeutics as re they relate to biophotonics, then apply some basic concepts learned uh, throughout this talk to uh, a novel disease process. And then in general, just sort of understand the needs of both the patients and clinicians and the role biophotonics may play in that. Uh, again, so brief introduction to biophotonics. Brian did cover this quite well. That at a fundamental level, biophotonics is the study of the interaction of light and matter, in our case, biological tissue. And I know some people have different timelines of when it started, but uh, the way I think about it is that the development of the first microscope could be considered the start of biophotonics, and that was around the year 1590. Um, and then afterwards, Anthony uh, Lewenhock, uh, and that's his microscope on the right here, uh, used a microscope to discover new aspects of life. And since then, many more microscopic techniques have been developed, including fluorescent microsco uh, microscopy, which I won't talk about today. I think that's pretty well known. Can focal, and then there's some super resolution microscopy techniques to look within the organelles inside a cell, and then Raman microscopy, another sort of nonlinear techniques. And then on the right here is just some various light microscopes as they've been developed over the years. Um, and I recommend if you have some time that Zeiss has an online university for microscopy, that's quite interesting. So you can check it out. And then furthermore, biophotonics studies the interaction. So photophysics, photochemistry, and photobiology, and that many of these processes are going on in your everyday life. So on the top right here, we have how photosynthesis works in plants and which provides life to all of us on this planet. Vision, this is retinol, so the main compound that would be used in vision, that when you absorb an uh, energy of a photon, you get this transition from cis retinol to all trans, and that gives the basis uh, for a neurological signal to your brain um, and provides vision. And then another one would be the firefly, which is bioluminescence. Now, switching from just going from biophotonics as a whole, so clinical biophotonics can be basically classified into two categories. So you have diagnostics and therapeutics. In diagnostics, if you look at the actual definition, it'd be the determination of the nature of a disease, injury, or congenital injury. Uh, and therapeutics is just relating to the treatment of the disease or disorders by remedial agents or methods. So in terms of diagnostic, a diagnosis, there's various techniques that have been developed uh, over the years. These includes, uh, this is actually a picture from Tyndall, but uh, microscopic analysis. So like uh, what pathologists are doing. Optical coherence tomography has been used in various applications. Sorry, and uh, I'll talk about one today, uh, but looking to see if you can see um, bladder cancer 
that may not be visual to the surgeon at the time of uh, treatment. Intravascular imaging is a relatively newer technique, um, and this is a project I was involved in, but basically we're looking inside a, an artery as a stent and coils have been placed. Um, and then sen sentinel lymph node mapping. So this is where you have a cancer and you're trying to see how far it progresses. You can inject a dye into the center of that cancer and then 10, 20, 15 minutes later, uh, you can look through fluorescence and see if any lymph nodes have been marked by the dye. And that probably indicates that there's cancer there as well. Uh, so they should be biopsied. In terms of therapeutics, again, looking at the application of light to treat a disease, one aspect is called photodynamic therapy. Uh, Brian spoke about this. Um, so you have a light source and a drug, and then that interaction can produce radical oxygen species and leads to tissue destruction or changes. So in this case, treating the bacteria and acne leads to acne removal. Photothermal therapy is a similar process where you can, you may or may not use a drug, but instead of uh, producing radical oxygen species, you're producing heat and leading to um, coagulation as you the tissue temperature reaches about 55 degrees Celsius. Uh, low level laser therapy is somewhat controversial topic, but the idea is, is you give a low level of LED or laser light, usually in the red um, and through a somewhat unknown mechanism. Uh, it stimulates oxidative phosphorylation in your cells and promotes tissue healing. I mean, then phototherapy is, again, using a blue or LE, uh, like a blue colored light source, you can treat, say, jaundice of the newborn by basically changing the, the bilirubin um, to, a more, uh, to a molecule that's more easily excreted by the body. Uh, so that was just like sort of a brief overview. Now in terms of the cases, so for all of these cases, I'm just going to go through sort of a clinical scenario with you and then how biophotonics uh, has fit in with the uh, treatment or diagnosis of that condition. So our first patient come to the office. She's a 67-year-old female. She complains of blurry vision, which is worse after exposure to sunlight that she's begun to lose the vision in the center of her eye. However, the vision around her is perfectly intact. Uh, so she smokes and one of her sisters and her mother lost their vision following a similar clinical course. Um, so what is the diagnosis? It could be a few things, but in this case, the most likely diagnosis would be age-related macular degeneration. So for a bit of biology, the macula seen here is at the center of your eye and it controls central vision and actually has the highest density of the cones um, within your retina. So these are what's used for color vision and high acuity vision. Um, in your brain, over 50% of the visual processing power of your brain would be devoted to the macula. And what happens through a somewhat uh, not understood mechanism is that this area of the eye begins to atrophy or get destroyed uh, by a few different processes. One of them is seen in B on the left here is, sorry, let me get a laser pointer, um, is when uh, cellular debris, which is called a druse, begins to develop underneath the photoreceptor cells. They die off and then you start uh, losing your vision. And here you can see various aspects. So this was just taken by a regular camera or a regular looking into the eye through a regular camera. Uh, you have the macula in C, that's normal. Uh, and then D and F, um, you can see is abnormal. And this person would begin to lose their vision. And then uh, this point here is where the optic nerve uh, exits the eye. So as I mentioned, the symptoms and looking into the eye suggest that this patient would have possibly has his age-related macular degeneration. So a couple of questions we can ask ourselves, but how is the disease classified? Can we visualize the extent of the damage beneath the retina? And as per this talk, is there a biophotonics application that can help with this? Um, so I guess the answer to the last one is there is, 
And with that, we can begin to answer uh, the first two questions as well. So one of the methods that we can use to evaluate the retina is called uh, optical coherence tomography. So this is a commercial system on the bottom left um, that many uh, ophthalmologists will have. Um, and then this is the image it produces of the macula. And you can see that you can quite easily visualize the different layers, maybe not perfectly, but enough to appreciate whether this is a normal or abnormal macula. So how does OCT work? Uh, so I guess at a fundamental level, uh, optical coherence co uh, tomography is a low coherence interferometric technique in that you're shining uh, light through two different arms. You have a reference arm here and a sample arm, and then you're measuring the interference pattern between those two. So the way it works is you can scan either up or down and then across. So if you're looking at one single point in depth, that is called an A scan. And then when you go across the image, um, that's called a B scan and you're looking at reflected light. So one of the, I guess the drawbacks to this technique is you cannot image deep, uh, but I'll say, but the reason it works for the eye is that the retina is actually quite thin and as such, you can get enough information from the entire layer of the retina or the back of the eye that makes diagnosis easy. And this is why this has been a widely adopted uh, technique in biophotonics for this application. So yeah, I mentioned some of this now, but so OCT is particularly suited for this application because it provides micrometer to submicrometer resolution, um, does not suffer due to the depth of the tissue because the tissue is quite thin. It's a non-contact imaging method, so you can image through the eye. Uh, it does not contain not any ionizing radiation, and there's no preparation um, of the sampler eye required. And it provides real-time images and create, can create 3D morphology based on multiple A and B scans. And it has been widely adopted for eye imaging. So. You have this person, this patient, she's in front of you. You do OCT. What are you looking for? So there's two types of age-related macular degeneration. The first one is called atrophic or dry. Um, so unfortunately, this cannot be treated and it's permanent. Um, and what happens here is that the top layers and the blue layer in the middle and panel B, just they atrophy or they begin to disintegrate through an unknown mechanism. But what you can appreciate is with OCT, you can now see that this has been completely flattened and that this retina or this macula no longer looks normal. And this would sort of give the clinician an idea of the extent of the injury, along with like the visual information and um, that the patient is providing to you. And as I said, unfortunately, this, this type of uh, age-related macular degeneration is not treatable, but you can, use methods to try and preserve whatever site is left and also preserve a site on the other eye. There's a second type of age-related ma uh, macular degeneration called uh, executive exudative or wet. I mean, this is what happens is when blood vessels grow into the center space here and begin to hemorrhage. And you can appreciate that with the black as well in these images. So once it begins to hemorrhage and leak out, there's a lot of inflammatory processes that happen, and this causes a disease and destruction, inflammation again of the retina or retinal layers. And OCT then is used to look at the extent of the disease, where the vessels may be, these triangles here, and whether they can be treated. So this type of uh, macular degeneration can be treated and there's various ways to treat it. And I will talk about uh, one of them, which uh, uses biophotonics in a second. So again, a summary here. So with OCT, we have diagnosed the patient with, for our purposes with wet age-related macular degeneration and can biophotonics provide any answers? So the goal of the treatment is to remove abnormal uh, blood vessel growth and to basically stop the blood vessels from penetrating into the retina 
and leaking. Um, so there's a number of different methods. Um, the most common and the most popular now would be uh, a biological therapy called anti-VEGF, where uh, VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, and it's also the most effective. However, before that was developed or widely used, it was actually a biophotonic technique, so photodynamic therapy. Um, so I won't go through the mechanism of PDT here because it's part of another case, uh, but Visudine, uh, which is the drug that was used for um, age-related macular degeneration for many years, is a porphyrin. Porphyrin just means it's this quatra ring structure um, similar to heme and hemoglobin in that it can create or produce radical oxygen species when it's excited by light. Uh, so usually it's 690 nanometers, which would be red light in the uh, visual spectrum. What happens is you would inject it into a vein, wait probably 10 or 15 minutes, and this is a schematic of the eye, the abnormal blood vessels within the macula. Um, and then you shine light through the eye again, and it destroys the blood vessels as seen at the bottom here through producing radical oxygen species. And with the destruction of these blood vessels, you can um, sort of reverse the damage that's been done or help reverse the damage that's been done. So again, widely used, and then we can use OCT to also monitor the changes before and after. So if we look at all these panels, these are all different forms of wet uh, a uh, MD, um, you can see the damage here. PDT is done and the damage has been somewhat reversed. Uh, again here, damage here, and it's now gone uh, three months later. Uh, damage here, again, gone, and the, the vision can be restored. Uh, there are some drawbacks to the technique, um, which is why it's been supplanted in, in that it could also induce damage in areas of the eye that weren't damaged before. And there's photosensitivity and also some toxicities to the drug, but it, it, it's still used and it was a very effective technique and it was probably the most widely prescribed photosensitizer until maybe uh, ALA, uh, which we will talk about um, in a few minutes. So getting back to our case and our patient here um, and where biophotonics fits in. So Biophotonics here is playing an important role throughout the entire clinical process where OCT can be used for the diagnosis. The other thing I didn't mention, which again would be widely used in many uh, clinics is uh, fluorescein fluorescent imaging, which helps visualize uh, all the blood vessels at the back of the eye. Um, and again, these are the mainstays of any clinical practice. And then in terms of the treatment, what we're looking at is PDT, uh, which again, occasionally is still used uh, to, depending on the clinic and the area um, for the treatment and hopefully to reverse or uh, stop the damage that's occurring in this disease process. Um, and that gives you sort of a general idea for one application, what biophotonics can do. Um, and as I said, there are more things that happen within the eye or within any of the cases I give today, but I just wanted to give a flavor of uh, sort of different applications and how they work. So now on to case two. Uh, so this one's a bit different, um, gender reproductive. So we have a 53 year old female who has noticed a lump in her right breast and came to the office. So the lump is somewhat firm with irregular borders. And she would be sent for a mammogram, ultrasound, and biopsy of the lump. She has no family history of breast or ovarian cancer. So diagnosis, or what are we thinking? Um, so what we're thinking is that uh, this case is highly suspicious for a breast carcinoma, and a biopsy would confirm the diagnosis. In our case, uh, the patient is diagnosed with something called ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. And she would pre be presented with a few treatment options, but mainly it would be surgery, uh, mastectomy, uh, which is removal of the entire breast, or a wide local excision or breast uh, conserving surgery. So that's where the 
the tumor plus some surrounding tissue is removed, but the breast um, is maintained and then followed by radiotherapy. So in this scenario, what is the role of biophotonics? So getting back to it, uh, sort of the treatment options, breast conserving surgery would be the mainstay uh, for this tumor type uh, and for this patient. And it's, as I said, normally followed by radiotherapy um, and usually not followed by sentinel lymph node mapping, which I uh, showed at the beginning of the presentation. So the idea is to re remove the tumor uh, with a surrounding area of tumor-free tissue that has to be greater than or equal to two millimeters. And if you reach that area beyond the tumor, that's called a negative margin. And then the likelihood of the tumor growing back is uh, significantly lower than if it's less than uh, two millimeters. Um, so this is a picture of uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. So you can see the tumor here in the darker purple is growing within one of the ducts of the breast. And then there's another tumor here. Uh, so what you're trying to do is remove all of this with two millimeters on every single edge in every direction. Um, so what is the clinical challenge? So the challenge is, is that you need to assess in real time what the margin is, whether it's positive. So a positive margin means there's either tumor at the edge of the image, so you're not sure you've removed everything, or negative in that you've had greater than two millimeters on every single side. Um, and the problem is, is that if you take this tumor out, finish the patient's surgery, and then pathology comes back and says this patient has positive margins of, let's say, one millimeter, um, that patient most likely has to be reoperated on. Again, and then with all the associated issues with repeat surgery, scarring, things like that, it's uh, generally something you want to avoid. So how margin status would be up, uh, assessed now would be what's called an H&E stain. So this is a tissue that's been removed from the body, put on a glass slide, and then stained with, uh, it's called hematoxylin and neosin. Um, and they stain nuclei and connective tissue a bit differently. So that's why you get these grades of pink to purple to dark purple and red. Um, so these, again, are two uh, slides of uh, DCIS um, that have been prepared um, just randomly. And then on the right here is basically how they assess the, the margins of a tumor. So in the top uh, left, you see various, uh, this is what tumor looks like, has been removed from a breast. And then the surgeon will do a couple things. One is he'll paint the tissue with various different colors. So that orientates the tissue for the pathologist to where it was. And he would also mark the tissue with sutures um, so that x-rays can be taken of it. And again, help orientate the pathologist to how that tissue was taken out of the body. So if there's any positive margins that they know where those margins were. Um, and then here is looking at various h &E preparations of these tissues. In D, that's a negative margin. There's enough space between where the tumor is to where the border of the tissue is, is that that patient you could assume has a good chance to not have a recurrence, at least within the um, surgical bed. Whereas in panel E, you can see that there's tumor within one millimeter to 0.1 millimeters of where the tissue has been taken out. So this is a positive margin. And at these depths, this patient would most likely have to have a reoperation to clean up the surgical field. And then F is similar in that these are considered positive margins. And this patient would have to be reassessed and most likely have a reoperation as well. So how does biophotonics uh, fit in with this, this clinical challenge or need? Um, so the idea is, is that instead of waiting the day or so, or the couple days that the previous images would take in pathology to read them, is whether we can do it inside the OR at the time of surgery, whether this patient has tumor-free margins or not. And then there's a couple other ways uh, that groups have looked at this challenge. One is to 
analyze the tissue prior to it being sent to the pathology lab. So that means you would give the surgeon results within 45 minutes that this is a tumor-free margin or not. Or you can analyze tissue samples within the OR that wouldn't be sent to pathology. Again, trying to assess whether this patient has uh, positive or negative margins and whether the uh, operation can be finished. Um, and then the goal, obviously, then is to reduce reoperation rates by informing of negative margins. Um, and to give an example, reoperation rates could be up to 20 to 30 percent, depending on the hospital you are at. Uh, some will be better than others, but it's very surgeon specific and also institute specific. So the idea is also to create sort of a quantitative analysis um, that you can say these neg margins are positive or negative and then move on. So again, this has been done multiple different ways, but I wanted this talk to show, I guess, different aspects of biophotonics and how they're used clinically. So some of the things I spoke about in terms of the eye, such as OCT could be used for this as well. Fluorescence imaging can be used for this, but what I wanted to talk about in this case is another process called photoacoustic imaging. So photoacoustic imaging uh, uses both ultrasound and pulsed laser light um, to generate images. Um, so the pulse laser would be at a wavelength of your choosing, basically trying to see what you're looking at. Normally, most people, uh, demonstrate it using blood. So oxy and deoxy hemoglobin absorb at slightly different wavelengths. So you can use different pulse lasers to find out the differences between the two and then get a map of the vessels. And that tumors have a uh, sort of different vasculature than the normal body. So this can be exploited with photoacoustic imaging to sort of produce a map of uh, blood vessels within a tumor with a normal tissue. Uh, but there's various different uh, laser wavelengths you could use to target different tissue types. The idea is, is that this pulse laser gets absorbed by molecules within the field and then it in induces a transient uh, thermal expansion or heat expansion. And then this expansion and relaxation creates uh, acoustic waves that are then picked up by a transducer. And I'm not really a physicist, but it goes through uh, various processing and then you get a reconstructed or an enhanced image. And as I mentioned, so what you could do is you can target various tissues depending on the wavelength. Um, as I said, most groups would target either oxy or deoxy hemoglobin in the red and blue here. And you can get these very fancy maps of uh, blood vessel architecture. So this was just a uh, study done showing uh, arterial blood flow within the hand, uh, a human hand, uh, using photoacoustic imaging and that just demonstrating that uh, just to show, I guess, the power of the technique. In terms of the breast cancer or our patient, though, uh, photoacoustic imaging has been developed. Uh, this is a group in Canada where they have a robot. Uh, and they submit the lumpectomy sample in water. And then this robot scans it with photoacoustic all around and looking to determine the negative or positive margins within this sample. And there's various different techniques upon this, but the idea is you bring the system into the OR, you get the sample from the surgeon, you put it in, you scan it with photoacoustic imaging, and you'll say positive or negative on the margins. Uh, looking at different aspects of so this group uses uh, lipids, uh, blood, as well as uh, various other markers, because you can use whatever wavelength you want, um, and then go back to the surgeon within 10 to 15 minutes and say, the sample is good, you can close up, or the sample is not good, you have to explore the surgical field a bit more. And uh, this is another group using sort of a, a similar method, uh, but using different components of the tissue. And again, they're trying to measure whether they're seeing positive or negative margins uh, using photoacoustic um, and whether that corresponds to histology. So again, looking at the bottom panel here, 
you have a, a margin of greater than three millimeters that they're demonstrating with component two uh, that's free of tumor and component one is considered tumor. So this person would neg have a negative margin and they'd be theoretically less likely to have um, a reoccurrence of their tumor, at least within the surgical bed. So talking about the role uh, of biophotonics uh, for this application, as I mentioned, this is one of several techniques being developed. Um, basically any biophotonics application you can think of is probably being developed uh, for this for this particular uh, challenge. Uh, so that includes fluorescence imaging, Raman imaging, optical tomography. Those are all examples with, and they all have the same goal. So to predict or demonstrate a positive margin in real time and avoid reoperations and to have a specificity or sensitivity to detect tumor cells at a resolution of less than two millimeters, because that's the, the margin you, you need to have. Uh, but um, the, way, the reason I picked this again, this is another good example of a of how biophotonics can address an ongoing clinical need that can't really be solved with anything else or hadn't been solved with anything else. To basically be able to go into real time determination of a margin hadn't been done before, and it's an ongoing clinical challenge, and hopefully one that biophotonics can reliably overcome in the next few years. However, uh, just to mention specifically for this patient or other patients with breast cancer, biophotonics is being developed uh, for throughout their clinical journey. So from diagnosis, you have different optical tomography techniques that are being uh, studied uh, to try and detect breast cancer early. For treatment, some groups now are exploring using photodynamic therapy post-surgery as sort of a a cleanup technique for treating any residual tumor cells, margin detection, which we talked about, and then pathology. So I just added this uh, paper here where they're using sort of quick real-time UV fluorescence imaging to try and determine high and low grade uh, tumor within a sample and whether there's any normal tissue. Um, and then trying to give, I guess, as quick as possible an idea what this tumor was, how aggressive it was, and how it needs to be treated. All right, now on to case three, so central nervous system. Uh, so this one is a bit more near and dear to my heart um, in that this is what my PhD was in. Uh, so we have a 59-year-old male. He's been feeling generally unwell for the past number of weeks with headaches, nausea, and vomiting. Yesterday, his wife witnessed him having a seizure, so he was brought to A&E. He has no significant past medical history, so no diagnosis of epilepsy or anything else. So what are we thinking of? So this patient has an MRI, and it shows a very large lesion within his brain. That's uh, This is called ring enhancing. So this is a T1-weighted image, and then the sort of white around the tumor would indicate uh, either an abscess or, or a tumor. Um, and then here we're just seeing pockets, this is a T2 image showing pockets of inflammation surrounding the tumor. Um, and unfortunately this person has been diagnosed with uh, stage four glioma, also called glioblastoma multiform. So this tumor is difficult to treat and it carries a very poor prognosis with a median survival time of around 15 months. And it's very prone to reoccur, uh, especially within the, the surgical bed. Um, the treatment for this patient would include the following. So it'd be surgical resection, trying to take out as much of the tumor as possible, followed by radiotherapy. And then whether he's the patient's suitable or not, uh, chemotherapy. However, there are some challenges. The one is that uh, these tumor cells, if you think of it like a spider web, they tend to nest within normal brain far outside the sort of core of the tumor, and it's very difficult to remove then. And then the second thing is you can't really take a wide margin as opposed to, say, breast cancer, um, where you're just removing lots of a normal brain. Um, and this is just sort of indicates the clinical challenges of GBM. One, in that it sort of grows. Uh, very differently. So depending on the environment at the time, 
you can get like five to six to eight genetically distinct tumors within a, a single person. So that's why chemotherapy doesn't really work um, and why surgery and radiotherapy is sort of the current mainstay. And the second thing is, is talking about this leading edge is where these tumor cells start going within the normal brain. Again, very difficult to remove uh, without affecting the normal brain. And then the third one, we don't need to talk about too much, but you get these cancer stem cells that grow right close to blood vessels. And again, it's very, very hard to remove them as well. So how does biophotonics help here? Um, so as I mentioned, Visudyne was probably the most prescribed photosensitizer prior to the development of this drug. Um, and the uh, application of fluorescence guided resection. So ALA um, is a drug. So ALA is normally produced in our body in every single cell uh, right here um, as part of the heme biosynthesis pathway. So heme, as you know, is the molecule that's found inside hemoglobin and it carries an iron uh, and that iron is which binds to oxygen and allows red blood cells to function. However, uh, protoporphyrin 9, which is the molecule directly before heme, so it's basically heme without the iron, is fluorescent, and it also can act as a photosensitizer. And for various reasons, tumors don't tend to produce a lot of ferroketolase. So if you give exogenous ALA, which gliolin is, you get a large buildup of protoporphyrin 9, and then that fluoresces. And this is just sort of a schematic of how it works as you would inject or the patient would drink or get injected with uh, ALA and then the tumor tends to glow. Uh, this is fos falsely colored. Um, and this is sort of what you see. So these are three patients with um, a GBM, uh, some of them in poor locations. Um, but what happens is you give ALA in a tumor that doesn't really look, well, this looks a bit different but in here, this tumor doesn't really look too different from normal brain. This is all normal brain, and then the green is all tumor. So it allows the surgeon to visualize in real time what, uh, what is tumor and what's not tumor, and then what he can remove. And the same thing here, these are pictures of uh, a surgical resection of glioma. Here, this all looks normal uh, to a, probably an untrained eye but you introduce ALA uh, and you look through fluorescence and you can see there's a pocket of tumor underneath here that you should remove. And same thing here, there's tumor that's been left behind within this resection cavity that should be removed. So this is sort of revolutionized um, surgical resection for glioma and that you can get now much higher rates of resection and that's allowing people to live longer and um, this has become standard of care, uh, I think, uh, well, definitely within North America and I think throughout Europe as well, um, and has both FDA and uh, EU approval uh, for use. So we've removed as much tumor as possible, but there are cases then where you may not be able to remove all the tumor. It's in an area that you can't touch or we just want to clean up if there's any tumor left, as I said, like those little pockets of tumor hiding uh, in areas that are inaccessible. So as I mentioned, protoporphyrin 9 can also uh, generate reactive oxygen species. So again, using the same method and exploiting the same drug, we can induce a large amount of protoporphyrin 9 within tumor cells. And then by absorbing light of a certain energy, or certain photon, and based on the properties of the photosensitizer, we can all get fluorescence, which is what we just spoke about. Or the photosensitizer can go through something called intersystem crossing, where it goes into a triplet state. And luckily, uh, oxygen in the ground level is in a triplet state. So these can exchange what's called spin flips, and then you get reactive oxygen species, and then that damages tumor cells. So this is a nice, I guess, schematic of how it works. So you have non-thermal red light. Um, you generate reactive oxygen species within a tumor that can destroy blood vessels, cause tumor cell necrosis and apoptosis, um, and leads to inflammation and cell death. Um, so that has also been exploited 
now for um, gliomas. So a lot of groups are looking at doing sort of this path through a biophotonics applications where they'll give ALA, do fluorescence guided resection, and then after the resection is completed, they'll insert either a balloon or various laser uh, uh, fibers and then do photodynamic therapy at the end of the procedure. And then the idea here is to then clean out whatever tumor is left. Um, and again, this has also shown uh, great promise, at least within certain groups, in that you have people living for much longer um, than would otherwise. And like in this patient here at the bottom, uh, their tumor hasn't grown back after seven months, which is uh, a good, uh, it's a very good outcome uh, for many of these patients compared to what was seen previously. So again, how does uh, biophotonics work here? So fluorescence guided resection PDT uh, represent many, one of the many applications of biophotonics. I could actually talk about, I guess, just brain cancer and biophotonics for the whole hour. Um, many of these I could, but it's also been widely, I guess, explored for diagnosis and biopsy. So autofluorescence and diffuse reflectance, which is what we're doing here at Tyndall. Uh, Raman spectroscopy, so various different techniques, but this is a Raman uh, core biopsy needle that's been developed in Montreal to take biopsies or uh, Raman biopsies of tumors, fluorescence lifetime imaging, OCT has been used as well. And then in terms of therapeutics, there's multiple photosensitizers, not just ALA used for photodynamic therapy, photothermal therapy as uh, commercial clinical systems being developed, and then metronomic PDT which uh, if anyone wants to ask me about, is sort of, a, I guess, a, just a bit of a different type of PDT. So in summary, uh, cases presented here um, are just a subset, I guess, of the uh, clinical applications of biophotonics. What I feel or what I think is the idea is to look at the clinical challenge. I know Brian spoke about a bit about this on Monday, and then see what technology, if any, can provide an advantage over existing standard of care. So that drives adoption or to address a problem where there is no solution. So talking about the margins or even osteomyelitis, something like that. Um, and I mostly in this talk spoke about uh, visible light interactions with tissue, um, but there are other applications, biophotonics, so like nonlinear optics techniques. Uh, so second harmonic generation, which is image use, used to image collagen. And then you can look within a tumor, collagen can be quite different uh, in terms of structure. So you'll get different second harmonic generation signals. Uh, Multi-photon microscopy, uh, UV autofluorescence, again, something our lab uh, is doing work in. Uh, and then IR Raman spectroscopy. Uh, the one thing I'd like to stress is just always think of what you're trying to do and then how biophotonics can achieve it. Um, and that usually puts you on a, on a good path. Um, and with that, I can answer any questions if there are any.